Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this uh, first session of the second day of Meta Research 2021. My name is Malcolm McLeod from the University of Edinburgh. I'll be moderating this session, Lessons for the Lab, How Meta Research is Shaping Basic Biomedical Research. And I'm grateful to uh, all of our speakers for agreeing to participate, and particularly to Manoj, uh, who uh, has corralled us and brought us all together, and you hear from Manoj later. So there's myself, Alex uh, Banach Brown, Manoj Takuji Uzi from uh, UBC, and Tracy Weisgerber. And I'm just going to say a few words by way of introduction before they go into talks. We'll have questions after each uh, uh, talk, and then time for questions, I hope, and discussion at the end. If you could put your questions into the Q&A slot, and we'll try and keep an eye on the chat as well. So here are my conflicts of interests. I'm academic coordinator of a European quality and preclinical data innovative medicines initiative, which is an industry academia partnership. A member of the UK drugs regulatory body, the Commission for Human Medicines, which is our equivalent of the FDA. And I'm academic lead for research improvement and research integrity at the University of Edinburgh. So you'll be pleased to hear that I believe that everything in Edinburgh is brilliant compared with everywhere else. I don't actually, but uh, if you detect bias, that may be where it's coming from. That may be where it's coming from. So let me take you back to the beginning of my journey about preclinical meta-analysis. So it's 2003. At that time, there's around 5.6 million strokes happening globally every year with a mortality of 20%. The only treatment we've got, clot-busting treatment with tissue plasminogen activator is time critical. And to get to that treatment, you need diagnosis, you need to be taken to hospital, you need brain imaging, all to allow the infusion to start within 180 minutes. So perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, there, wasn't a much, uh, there wasn't much thrombolysis going on. And the question we had was, could we identify a safe treatment where it wouldn't really matter if the diagnosis was wrong that we could give to patients in the back of an ambulance? And here's an example of something that might be safe. This is low-dose glutamate and homeopath homeopathic arnica montana, tested here in an animal model of stroke where the blood vessel on one side to the animal brain is occluded. Some of the animals get treatment, some of the animals don't. And what you hope to see for an effective treatment is that the volume of brain injury shown here as infarct volume increases as you give more of the drug. Uh, of course, those of you who've seen some of my talks before may recall that half dose, low dose glutamate is 10 to the minus 120 molar and full dose is 10 to the six, minus 60 molar. So this wasn't a treatment that we were going to take into the ambulance given that Avogadro's constant is 10 to the 23. So there isn't any glutamate in either of these. There might be something wrong with this kind of research and that might also be something that systematic review and meta-analysis could tell you about. So we looked at all interventions tested in experimental stroke, over a thousand compounds tested in the lab, over 600 tested in those animal models that we were interested in, remarkably almost 400 improving outcome in those animal models, of which 97 had gone on to be tested in human clinical trial, of which one, that clot busting treatment with TPA was the only one that worked. And it had been tested in human stroke, not because it works in animal models of stroke, although it does, and Emily Sin has shown in meta-analysis that it does, because it works in a very similar human condition where the blood supply to a critical organ, in that case, the heart, was occluded. And we had treatments, stroke unit care, decompressive hemicraniectomy and aspirin, which hadn't been tested through animal studies at all. So starting to through meta research, I suppose, although that's not what we called it at the time, to understand that there might be something wrong with drug development. And here's some work we did a few years later, looking at the studies supporting the effectiveness of a drug called NXY059 that had been taken to clinical trial in stroke by AstraZeneca. And that clinical trial, unfortunately, uh, was neutral. The drug didn't do anything. And when, with the benefit of hindsight, we went back to look at the animal data supporting the trial, Overall, the treatment's pretty effective. These are the 95% confidence limits of the effect in these gray bars. But when we look at those studies that reported measures to reduce the risk of bias, like randomization or blinding, or blinding in the assessment of outcome, they give substantially and, uh, and significantly small, lower estimates of drug efficacy in these animal models. And importantly, I think, not one of these studies did all three of these things. And the studies used by the company to persuade doctors to put patients into trial 
with the most positive findings, actually had done none of these things. So at this stage in my career, I was relatively junior, and I was told that everyone knew that stroke researchers were stupid and didn't know how to do things properly. We should look more generally at high quality research. Uh, we're having some sessions, I think, on measuring research outputs, but here's the, the British example, the research assessment exercise from 2008, which is astonished really by how good everything is in the United Kingdom, which is often the UK way. So we identified the five institutions which were at the top of their game for in vivo research in that period, and then drew out about a thousand publications in the subsequent two years involving animal research. And then we asked a question, how good are these studies at reporting randomization, blinding, inclusions and exclusions and sample size calculations? They're color coded to protect my future career prospects such as they are, lovely blue Scottish color here, but randomization in only about 14%, blinding in less than 20%, reporting animals excluded from analysis in only 10%, and only one in 50 studies reporting a power calculation. Uh, and 68% of those 1,173 publications from leading institutions did not one of those things, and only one paper out of over 1,000 did all of those things. So it's not just stroke research that's wonky. Everything is a bit wonky. So the purposes of evidence synthesis, I think, looking at things how we saw them in 2004, was firstly, could we use them to choose drugs for clinical trials? So here's a systematic review, sorry, a systematic review of hypothermia and animal models of stroke with Bart van der Voorp, and that led to the design of our clinical trial of hypothermia in acute ischemic stroke, the Eurohype 1 trial, recently completed unfortunately didn't uh, recruit enough patients to say things one way or the other. But this parallel track of using systematic review to inform research improvement. So here's our original study on nicotinamide showing study design uh, bias and publication bias leading to good laboratory practice guidelines in stroke in 2009, which have been reasonably influential in moving the field forward. And fast forward to now, what sort of things can we do with evidence synthesis? And you're gonna hear a lot more about these from the other speakers, but here's, the, here's how we choose drugs for clinical trial now. This is MND SMART a multi-arm adaptive randomization trial where the choice of the drug is informed by a living systematic review, which is organized and conducted by Dr. Karis Wong, a physician doing a PhD with us. And as one drug shows that it meets the futility criteria of the trial, it's replaced immediately by the most promising next drug. And work that we're doing with Xiang Ying Wang just now, a PhD student, student to inform research improvement looking at things like the Landis uh, reporting guidelines, the MDAR checklist and the new ARRIVE guidelines, automating the evaluation of risks of bias in uh, actually 500,000 in vivo publications using natural language processing. And there are other groups doing similar things. And I think it's a very powerful way in, in which we can try and inform research improvement activities. And it's not just in terms of clinical medicine, there are other groups that are using pre-clinical evidence to inform their regulatory decision-making where clinical trials would not be uh, feasible or ethical. So environmental toxicology, the navigation guide group, group, group at UCSF and OHAT, food safety, a tool used by EFSA, plant protection, the SPRINT is a, a Horizon 2020 program looking at pesticides uh, and their effects on the environment and human health. And over the years, systematic reviews have evolved, I think, and I don't think anyone else in the panel is old enough to remember what it was like in the bad old days when one person was at one computer with a stack of PDFs going through them. And then we thought, well, maybe it would be good to get two people to look at things around the same computer. This is when Emily uh, joined us. And then starting to use distributed software to be able to do it at a distance. And now with systems like our systematic review platform and others where people can collabor collaborate over the cloud, in the conduct of the systematic reviews, which has really enabled much larger systematic reviews to be done. And moving towards the idea that the information that we curate and collect in the context of one systematic review uh, might uh, then go into a central data store and be used for others. And even perhaps one day, that process of automation, that process of automation might happen at the point that the research artifact is produced, that's to say at publication or bioarchive deposition, uh, rather, um, rather than only when it pops up in a systematic review. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. I'd be happy to take any questions 
Uh, now, if anyone has any in the chat, but I just then need to see the chat. And Silene says, good morning. Good morning, Silene. Let's see if there's anything in the Q&A, and there's no open questions in the Q&A. So what I would propose to do now is to go to our first uh, proper speaker, as it were, who is Alexander Bannock brown from uh, the Berlin Institute for Health Quest Centre in Germany. Uh, Alex, uh, I don't know if you want to try and get your slides up just now. You should be able to share them. Uh, Alex actually came to Edinburgh to do a PhD, and some of my colleagues who knew her previously were very jealous. They said, you've got an excellent PhD candidate there. And so it turned out, and she's now gone on to uh, better things, firstly with Paul Glasgow and his group at Bond in Australia, and now at the Quest Centre for, Re Re for Responsible Research at the charity. So Alex, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Martha, for the introduction. Are you able to see the full uh, slides? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Great. Um, so, yes, yeah, systematic review is a useful tool um, in preclinical research to get an overview um, of the literature. Um, and in this talk, I'm just going to describe um, a case study or an example of how systematic review was used to identify gaps in the literature um, and to um, how it was used to inform the design of a primary animal experiment. Um, and I don't think it's uh, any surprise that there is a growing um, amount of literature out there. Um, but with that also comes the increasing um, uh, interest in reviewing um, larger and uh, more extensive research areas. Um, so the numbers of um, records that are identified by systematic searches is um, also increasing um, as exponentially as the amount of literature being published. Um, this highlights the need for automation tools and to support meta research um, in this area. Um, I conducted a systematic review of animal models of depression um, with over 70,000 potentially relevant um, records being retrieved. Um, it was not feasible to screen them manually in a timely manner. Um, so we trained a machine learning algorithm to um, uh, include these articles in the review uh, if they were relevant, um, which uh, reached a high level um, of performance um, and included uh, over 18,000 um, studies. We then used um, text mining approaches um, to group and visualize um, the articles um, to get an overview um, of this broad, uh, really broad body uh, of literature, um, which was then developed uh, into a web app. Uh, using this machine uh, assisted approach, um, we conducted a systematic review to understand the efficacy of um, interventions targeting um, the gut microbiota in animal models of depression. We aim to get an overview of the literature to identify um, any gaps um, and to understand the quality um, of this evidence. Um, so the studies were identified using um, the text mining approach um, and added to the systematic review platform SURF um, for full data extraction. Uh, using the standard uh, systematic review uh, process, 15 um, publications were um, included. Um, and interestingly, we identified studies that were both using uh, microbial interventions to um, rescue a depressive-like phenotype, um, as well as studies that were using a microbial intervention to um, induce a depressive-like phenotype, um, such as antibiotics. Um, in this literature, the reporting of um, conflicts of interest and compliance with animal welfare regulations, which was, uh, was high, uh, thankfully. Um, about 40 to 50% of the studies reported um, randomization um, or blinding. Um, but reporting of sample size calculation um, was very poor. Um, the results of the meta-analysis um, were kind of as expected. Um, the studies that used a, a microbial intervention to try to induce a depressive-like phenotype, um, the pooled effect size um, did show a worsening, um, worsening in the behavior. Um, and the studies that uh, used a microbial intervention to rescue a depressive-like phenotype um, unsurprisingly showed um, an improvement um, in behavior. Um, what was interesting about the systematic review though um, was um, heterogeneity. Um, so no two studies investigated the same intervention. So there, there were no two same strains of probiotics used. And there were also a very wide range of outcomes. Um, we had hoped to pull data um, from other biological um, outcomes such as um, in, in immune and inflammatory responses, um, but there was simply too much heterogeneity in the types of um, bio, biomarkers that people were, uh, were interested in. Um, further, it highlighted uh, quality, 
um, only one study reported a sample size calculation um, and approximately um, 40 to 50 percent of the studies reported randomization um, or blinding um, but um, no study reported um, all three uh, of these measures Further, um, the median uh, group size um, was 10 animals per group. Um, in clinical studies, the effect of probiotics uh, on depression or um, depressive symptoms is very small. Um, and this was worrying um, because animal studies with 10 animals per group are likely to be underpowered to detect an effect size this small. Um, and further, the systematic review um, showed a gap in the literature. Um, probiotics um, were, um, yeah, there was an interest in the clinical space uh, for, uh, sorry, prebiotics um, to, um, to assist with uh, mild depressive symptoms, um, but there was a lack of preclinical evidence um, on this intervention. So to address some of these concerns, we designed a primary animal experiment um, pre-registered um, to test the effects of prebiotics on um, depressive-like phenotypes. Um, the experiment was designed, conducted, um, where animals were randomly allocated uh, to groups. Um, our group allocation was concealed throughout, and all outcomes were assessed um, in a blinded manner. Um, further, we did an a priori sample size calculation um, where the unit of analysis, um, the, small, the smallest unit um, the intervention can independently be administered to, um, which in this case um, was the um, cage. Um, because animals are co-housed. When they're co-housed, they share a bacterial profile um, and the intervention is thought to act through um, the gut microbiota. So the results of the experiment showed no significant differences between um, vehicle and prebiotic groups. So um, there was no uh, rescuing of depressive-like behavior. Um, however, when we uh, redid the uh, analysis, redid the statistics, where the unit of analysis was the individual animal rather than the cage, um, this showed a significant effect um, of uh, prebiotics on, uh, on the primary outcome of interest. And often results are presented in the literature where the statistics are conducted um, on the animal um, and the reporting of the housing conditions is so variable, it's often um, not possible to understand whether the animals were in fact co-housed or single housed. So just to um, highlight this point with a hypothetical example, if you take two groups of animals um, with a, a mean value of 10 and 15 um, in an outcome, if the group size is reported as n equals 10, you get a nice uh, significant result. But if the animals are actually housed two and two, um, then the real n number is five. And the n, when n is five, the confidence intervals increase um, to a point where your outcome is it's no longer significant. There is no significant difference between your two groups. So without accounting for the correct unit of, uh, of analysis, this can lead to an overestimation um, of efficacy. Um, so reporting of unit analysis is not only important for primary studies, um, but this also has implications um, for meta-research of, uh, of animal studies and preclinical biomedicine. So just to sum up, um, systematic review can be used to identify um, gaps in the literature uh, in preclinical studies. Um, and it can also um, very nicely be used to um, highlight the quality of reporting um, in a body of evidence. We, um, yeah, it's a, it's a big area to improve uh, reporting of uh, primary animal experiments. Um, so this is a really useful tool for that. And further, um, evidence synthesis is a hypothesis generating tool, um, which can be used um, to inform uh, the design of um, primary animal experiments. Um, and I'd just like to um, acknowledge the funding for this work and the support um, of colleagues in the um, studies described here. I do believe we have um, time for some questions. Yeah, are. thanks. Thanks very much. Alex. There's a couple of questions coming in in the chat. They can either go into the chat or the uh, Q&A. Uh, and so first of all, from Shambhavi Chidambaram, is did you show the nine when you showed your uh, difference between the group housing versus considering doing the pseudo replication? Were they ninety five percent credibility intervals or ninety five percent confidence intervals? Confidence intervals. Confidence intervals. Okay. Uh, question from Silene: uh, uh, Do you think it's also possible to apply systematic review and meta analysis to synthesize data of studies performed? before animal studies. So could you use systematic review for bioinformatics or for in vitro studies or, or whatever? Um, thank you for that question. That's uh, it's really important. Yeah, um, 
uh, systematic review of in, in vitro literature is um, is a growing field, and I um, believe there is um, several efforts to um, translate the methodology of systematic review um, to be able to um, accurately um, synthesize um, in vitro studies, studies from cells, um, as well as bioinformatics. So yeah, that is, um, that is a growing field and hopefully we'll see some more concrete methodological um, advice in this area in the future. Good, good. And a final uh, question about the uh, prebiotic effect, wondering whether the reason that you saw it in one with pseudo replication but not without was that the number of that the, the effect was so small uh, that the experiment was underpowered at the cage level is that possible um so um the a priori sample size calculation um given that there was no preclinical evidence in this um in this field before um, the a priori sample size calculations was based on um, effect sizes seen um, in the probiotics. Um, looking at the clinical literature, we could see that there was a similar effect of probiotics, slightly lower of prebiotics. It's, um, it's definitely um, possible um, that it could have been underpowered, um, although this primary experiment was significantly higher powered than the existing literature that was out there. Uh, and uh, then I think we've got time for uh, some more from Shona Gordon McKeon. She asks, sorry if I missed this, are the tools of your analysis documented available anywhere, like in a Jupyter notebook or on OSF or GitHub or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Most of the um, information is uh, available uh, on OSF um, and or GitHub, um, along with accompanying publications. Yeah. I'd be happy uh, to send any links. And in terms of tools to support preclinical uh, systematic reviews, there is, of course, the uh, SURF platform, uh, which we run with funding from the NC3Rs uh, in the UK, which allows a lot of the process of systematic review to be done. And we're gradually embedding some of these automation tools into there as they become available. So that's in the chat now. Uh, uh, so was there another, there was another thing that occurred to me and I've forgotten what it was, which I think means that you're off the hook for the time being, Alex. So thank you very much. And now on to Manoj, uh, who is, uh, uh, He's, he's an anaesthetist, really, I think. Well, a critical care doctor, but a kind of yeah, Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, uh, but he's, uh, he's another clinician that's come into the world of systematic review of preclinical data in an attempt to better inform the clinical research which he has been doing. And he's going to talk, to, uh, talk with us today about one particular approach uh, that may help refine uh, the validity of those inputs. So Manoj, over to you. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, can you see my slides right now? Is everything? Yes, they're perfect. perfect. Okay. okay, fantastic. Okay, thanks for the, uh, the kind introduction there. Um, and uh, as Malcolm mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, one approach and that's multi-center preclinical lab studies. Uh, and I've put a bit of a provocative title here, suggesting that they may be better in some ways than single lab approaches. Uh, so in terms of what these are, uh, I know I'm sure many of you have thought about or heard about multi-center studies. Uh, what they are, when multiple independent laboratories perform the same experiment using a shared protocol. And the reason I was particularly interested in this approach, uh, again, is that um, I actually have a basic science training. So my PhD is actually in a wet, from a wet lab and wet lab research. Uh, but uh, as Malcolm mentioned, I'm a clinician now and uh, I have both a wet lab and my primary appointment is actually in clinical epidemiology. So I'm always really interested to try to see and uh, if we can apply some of the methods that have been highly successful in clinical research uh, back into the wet lab setting. Uh, and as many of you might be aware, multi-center studies uh, are a gold standard in, in clinical trials. So here's just a little schematic. You have one lab here with one protocol. 
Uh, and this lab has now shared this protocol amongst uh, three other labs. So now you have four labs, all using a common protocol, all performing uh, the same or very similar experiments. So why might you want to do this? There's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, these design, the studies designed this way, excuse me, inherently test reproducibility and generalizability. They can be potentially more robust than single center studies, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, perhaps one of those is that you have a number of different experts as opposed to one principal investigator leading a lab. You have now multiple uh, principal investigators, multiple senior investigators sitting around a table and uh, hopefully a priori identifying pitfalls that might occur. Finally, there is this thought uh, that this sort of design might increase the efficiency of preclinical translation. So by that, what I mean is uh, basically if you had a intervention, for instance, which was highly successful in multiple single center studies, uh, and then you brought it towards a more rigorously designed multi-laboratory study and it failed, that might give you pause and start to think about, well, do we need to refine this therapy before we continue its development pathway? Or on the other hand, if you had a uh, intervention that was successful in single center lab, uh, laboratory studies, and then you brought it towards a multi-center laboratory approach, and it was also successful there, well, that might give you fodder to think about, okay, we can probably continue on this translational pathway, uh, you know, going into larger animal models, for instance, or maybe even a first in human study. So why on the flip side, would you not want to do this sort of study? Uh, I've talked to many people about this for the last few years and I've really heard a number of different reasons. Uh, these are just some highlights. First of all, different labs have distinct pressures, different resources available, and uh, many labs even that study the same sort of disease state have far different behavior norms as well too. And that can make it very difficult potentially to collaborate with each other. Uh, secondly, I think a major issue is the publisher parish culture. So when you're thinking about a multi-center study, uh, you know, in a clinical trial, for instance, um, you have often tens of authors. Uh, however, if it's you know, a well-conducted trial uh, published in a reputable journal, even being a middle author there can give you, uh, you know, credit or credit is given to, uh, towards you for that. However, in uh, basic science or you know, basic biomedical research, at least, first, second or last author uh, usually are given the most credit. I, I have to say the same thing is in clinical research as well, too. Um, however, being a middle author and a long list of authors for a basic biomedical research study, it's still not as appreciated as much uh, as uh, being a middle author, for instance, in a large multicenter clinical trial. So this can obviously be a, a disincentive to potentially participate in this sort of study. There's also first mover advantage. Uh, so to try to be first past the post on things makes you resistant to collaboration potentially as well too. And then finally, one issue that uh, my group and others around the world have uh, encountered is that there's very few organizations that are actually funding this type of work as well too. Uh, so that can make it very difficult to conduct these studies, which can be very expensive as well, too. So my group was really interested in trying to see what the landscape of these multicenter preclinical studies were. So these multi-laboratory studies. So we conducted a systematic review. What I'll be showing you in the next few slides is actually unpublished work. Uh, so if you happen to be an editor and you're interested in this sort of area, uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards as a, we are looking for a venue to publish this. Um, so for our systematic review, we registered our protocol a priori in Prospero. Uh, we conducted a systematic search of two databases, Embase and Medline. And what we were looking for were in vivo studies, so in animal, live animal studies, where they had tested an intervention, typically a therapy. And of course they had this multi-center or multi-laboratory design. And we used best practices in terms of duplicate screening, duplicate extraction. And in the end, what we found was that there were only, um, trying to make my slide work here, 16 of these uh, studies that have been published ever to date. However, what's interesting is that 12 of those have been published since 2015, making this, uh, you know, or demonstrating that this probably has a bit more interest uh, recently as well, too. And in terms of where these studies were conducted, uh, the majority of them were in the United States with a smattering of other countries involved. 
Diverse clinical spheres, though, that were being investigated. So, for instance, stroke, uh, brain injury, traumatic brain injury, myocardial infarction. And next, what we were thinking about were the outcomes of these studies. And we want to quantify or compare quantitatively the outcomes of these uh, multi center studies to previous single center studies. So, again, uh, looking to the clinical uh, research trial research literature for inspiration, uh, we actually found these landmark studies where they had in clinical trials compared effect sizes from single center clinical trials to multi-center uh, clinical trials. And what they had found, I'll just point down to the bottom here, is that single center trials show larger treatment effects than multi-center trials. Uh, so that might seem obvious, but these were some of the first studies to actually quantify this sort of effect. In other words, these single center clinical trials inflated effect size, and uh, these multi center trials actually showed smaller effect size. And the effect sizes for these multi center trials actually were closer or paralleled closer what the real world effects of some of those treatments were as well, too. So we're very interested to see is there a similar effect in preclinical studies? So to do this, we paired our 16 multi center studies with uh, 100 single center studies. These studies were paired along the interventions that were tested as well, they were paired along the disease uh, states that were being investigated. You can see here a comparison uh, with the sample sizes, so much larger sample size uh, in their multi-center versus single center. However, the total number of animals being used was approximately the same. The publication uh, range was, or date range, excuse me, was around the same as well too. And you can see that, not surprisingly, most of these studies were using rodent models. What was quite different, though, uh, was their methods to potentially reduce risk of bias. So methods like randomization and blinding. Uh, and you can see here, again, a comparison between our multi-center and our single-center studies, uh, with our multi-center studies uh, having a much larger percentage of them uh, adhering or basically addressing methods to reduce risk of bias. So overall, multi-center studies address these, oh, my watch is talking to me, uh, address measures to reduce bias than single center studies. We then quantitatively looked at this. So this is a forest plot comparing the difference in standardized mean difference between these pairs that I've shown you in the previous slide. So each row represents one multi-center study paired with a number of single center studies uh, that we could find. You can see overall, uh, and I'll point your eye down to the bottom here with our pooled analysis here, that there was in fact a larger effect size seen in our single center studies compared to our uh, multi-center studies. So in other words, paralleling exactly what has previously been shown in the clinical trial research literature. So in other words, there was a larger effect size in these single center studies than multi-center studies. And there were notable differences in sample sizes and methodological rigor. I just have two more slides, Malcolm, so I'll just take another minute here. There, uh, we then moved on to a, a separate study. This was a qualitative study where we uh, conducted semi-structured interviews with the investigators who had actually led or had been on the ground conducting these multi-center preclinical studies. And I'll just give you one slide here of highlights of what they told us. Uh, so in terms of barriers, they said, as I mentioned previously, that funding was a big barrier. These studies were very expensive. Uh, the culture and climate of uh, the science community make th made these studies difficult as well, too, as uh, you know, this approach wasn't valued. Uh, more practically, protocol harmonization between the centers uh, was difficult as well, too, in some cases. And differences in lab resources that are available and differences in the local animal ethics committees uh, also made it very difficult to conduct these studies in some ways. However, on the flip side, there was lots of facilitators, first of all, open-mindedness and trust between the investigators, having regular meetings and very regular engagement between the centers. And then finally, uh, again, this is actually something we do in clinical trials, site visits and on the ground training as well was very valuable for those studies that were successful. Uh, last slide here, I just wanted to show that uh, this wasn't uh, meta research for the sake of meta research, we've actually used some of the learning from 
uh, the systematic review that I've uh, shown you, as well as the interview studies to set up our own uh, multi-center preclinical collaborative. This is funded by Sepsis Canada, as well as another federal funder. So we're lucky to get some funding from a couple of sources. Uh, and we're actually moving towards multi-center studies of uh, preclinical sepsis models. So that's it. Uh, these are my uh, collaborators uh, for different aspects of this project. And uh, I should mention Victoria Hunterford was a, a student and research assistant who uh, helped lead some of that systematic review work that I had shown. Thank you. Thanks, Manoj. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, coming in, uh, and I'm going to uh, bring the first two together into one because I think it'd be easier. So uh, Michael Andrade has asked if there's a known source of funding committed to multi-lab research initiative as any country or institution be leading that path. And Jeff Mogo, a pain researcher, says it seems to me that incentives such as these will never be permissive for, you talked about incentives earlier, but not sure that the incentive system should change. Do you think that the solution might be to have funding agencies solicit groups to perform multi-center replication studies around identified important findings using a contract system rather than a granting mechanism? Yeah, I, I, so I think um, uh, the first is, uh, uh, you know, the ones I know about, Malcolm Shreen, about others, uh, I mean, BMBF, uh, for instance, in Germany has funded a number of uh, multi-center preclinical studies a couple of years ago now. I think the timing wasn't the best with the pandemic, but uh, um, so uh, I think we'll be hearing about that uh, in the next few years as they funded a number of those studies. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, Jeffrey's um, question, I think, is a good one. Uh, so Jeffrey is Canadian as well too. So I, I went to CHR several times with, uh, with you know, uh, with very good questions, and I was unable to get funding over several cycles. And then we found a different mechanism through Sepsis Canada, which is also CHR funded, our federal funder. Um, and then our we presented as a new idea for the New Frontiers and Research Fund as well too, which Jeffrey will be um, uh, uh, familiar with, which funds uh, high risk, high reward research. Uh, so we have been successful, but that being said, I think your idea is great. I think that's exactly what should be happening. Once we have single uh, laboratory studies, as you've described in your previous editorials in Nature, I think with Malcolm, you know, talking about confirmatory versus exploratory research, uh, you know, once we have a number of different exploratory studies demonstrating some potential, I think this is a mechanism that should be looked at to um, think about, again, that development pathway. Uh, before we move into, you know, first in human or even larger animal studies. Yeah, and I think also NIH had a similar, NINDS had a similar program for stroke research where they envisaged the creation of a network of preclinical researchers who would come together, but quite how that would work, uh, I'm not uh, aware of. And uh, the spinal cord community did something similar many, many years ago, Ozzy Stewart and others. Uh, Although again, not quite the multi-center study, each addressing the identical question as you've as you've suggested. Um, so a comment from Wolf in the chat: the BMBF project is still ongoing uh, in Germany. Most projects have been funded for three years. There's a question from Olavo Amaral, which I'm going to segue with a question from Cyrene. So Olavo says. Have you tried controlling for the methodological confounders in this study in this, and the differences in those between the single centre studies and the multi-centre studies to see whether that's the different, that, that drives the difference in effect sizes, single centre non-randomised? And Cyrene wonders whether the smaller sample size in the uh, single centre studies means that you're getting inflation of effect sizes because you're getting reporting of the, of, it's only the large effects that are reported, so a kind of publication bias sort of thing. And then Dan Finelli has got a related comment, which I'll come to after you've had a, a shot at those. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, Celine will answer that question first. Um, yeah, well, undoubtedly that uh, plays a role in that. And it's exactly what we've seen in the clinical trial literature that's been looked at very carefully as well too. So uh, I have no doubt that, uh, you know, the inflation of effect size is related to that. And it, that goes to a lot of those comments as well too. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, you know, we should probably do a meta regression around that, uh, the different aspects, uh, that's, that's a good point. And maybe we could start to pick out what factors are actually driving uh, some of those differences. Uh, that being said, um, you know, even if uh, there was no differences, and I was prepared for that, obviously, we didn't know what we we're going to find in the end, uh, I think there still is inherent value in 
testing uh, uh, the same protocol in multiple centers. And uh, that inherent value all comes from, again, the generalizability uh, and the external validity that uh, you're testing or assessing uh, with this sort of approach, which, uh, you know, there might be other ways to do it within a lab, but uh, putting it in different environments, different microbiomes, uh, different equipment, et cetera, really speaks to the generalizability of your findings. And then finally, Dan Finelli's got a good, uh, it's an observation come question, but wondering how, how surprised you were, and hopefully you weren't surprised because one should never ask a research question that one doesn't at least have some sense of knowing that you're going to get something interesting at the end of it, at this difference between single centre and multi-centre studies. But, but if you consider that the single centre studies might be considered epistemologically as, as exploratory and hypothesis generating, even though that might not be how their findings were presented in the ensuing publications, and the multi-center studies are confirmatory, then uh, the former being biased in favor of signal detection, the latter in favor of generalizability. Is, is, do you think that's a, that's a thing? And does that make more of a case for multi-center studies? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I wasn't overly surprised, you know, looking back at your work, Malcolm, and others, where they've clearly demonstrated the risk of bias is uh, associated with, or a lack of addressing those issues is associated with larger effect sizes. We weren't overly surprised with the results in the end, uh, because uh, as I've demonstrated, those multicenter studies seem to uh, adhere to those methods to reduce bias, right? So I think that's one piece there. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, I guess, um, uh, you know, comparing those sort of two study types, um, you know, I think the, uh, there's still a, a role for this multi-center uh, approach. And, and one thing I didn't actually very say, say very explicitly there was that most of these studies actually did not demonstrate any effect. So I, I showed the difference in effect sizes there, but most of them actually uh, showed no effect uh, for the therapy that they're looking at, right? So again, uh, that's one piece I, I should have made a bit more explicit there. Uh, so again, that, that, I believe that shows some value in, in at least thinking about maybe not ditching that intervention, but starting to think about, okay, how can I refine this so that in a rigorously conducted study, we can still see effect sizes there as well too. So I think that speaks to where these should be done. It goes back to Jeffrey's comment there at the very beginning as well too, where you know I 100% agree we still need exploratory studies. You need room as a basic scientist to tinker. I, I've been allowed myself, I know that you know, things are a very straight line from A to B, right? Uh, you often take a very circuitous pathway to get to some exciting findings, but then uh, to start to move that into humans or to larger animals, I think that's where we need to start thinking about more rigorous approaches before we do that. And can I, can I uh, take Chairman's prerogative and, and ask a final question, which is when you're powering those multi-center studies, because Alex made a point earlier on in her talk that she powered hers on the basis of what probiotics did. And there's this question about whether you should be powering on what you might reasonably expect to find or on what you would consider to be a minimum effect size of interest. And if you're powering multi-centre animal study on a minimum effect size of interest, what is the effect size that makes you interested enough to think about doing a clinical trial? I have I no answer for that. Do you, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> I think uh, that's a good question. I, I think that there's a, a nice study in the making there. So looking at, uh, you know, I think we could look at quantitatively uh, comparing some of these studies that led to successful clinical trials and seeing what those differences actually were, right? So there might be something there in the future to look at. It's a, it's a good idea, but unless you have an answer, I don't, I don't actually have a firm answer for that, though. Uh, I'm still at the stage of life where I've got uh, answers. Uh, I've got questions, but not so many answers. Um, so thanks, Manoj. Um, next, we've got Takuji. Now, when I first met Takuji, he was a PhD student uh, with uh, Shinichi Nagakawa at the University of New South Wales. And he comes from a very different background uh, in... Uh, in ecology and, e and evolution. And what he's done with Shinichi and others is to apply their approach to some of the literature from systematic reviews of uh, preclinical studies. So Takuji, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, uh, I'm still a PhD student. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I'm now at the Biodiversity Research Center at the University of British Columbia. 
Um, and yeah, as Malcolm said, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project I did uh, in Australia uh, on how we can embrace heterogeneity to improve uh, replicability. So yeah, just uh, before I dive in, just a quick acknowledgement to my co-authors for this project. Um, this project was made uh, possible through a collaboration of an interdisciplinary team of researchers, as Malcolm mentioned, uh, those that specialize in evolutionary biology, such as myself, and uh, meta-analyses, uh, as well as experts in preclinical science and uh, biomedicine over at the Camaradas team. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about uh, replicability and generalizability. Um, already, and there are a number of things that we need to obviously consider when designing such experiments uh, in biome biomedicine. Uh, so traditionally, we've tended to focus our efforts on uh, our ability to, to uh, detect treatment effects, in other words, ensuring high internal validity, uh, such that we have high confidence that any change that we detect is due to our treatment of interest. Uh, and along with that, obviously, we've tended to want to minimize any confounding variables uh, by reducing within-study variability, essentially treating this as statistical noise. Um, and of course, when designing any experiment, uh, we have to also consider any uh, uh, ethical or financial concerns, uh, for example, by reducing or trying to reduce the number of animals used. And so to meet these goals, we've uh, traditionally followed the dogma of standardization, which of course is to minimize variability within studies uh, as a means of a reduction in the number of animals used to obtain information uh, of a given amount and precision. Uh, but my question is, does standardization actually lead to replicable and generalizable experiments? Uh, well, some theory has shown that perhaps not. And the reason for this is that uh, whilst standardization increases the internal validity and the power to detect treatment effects within studies, uh, it also reduces the external validity uh, or the consistency of results across studies. And to explain this very briefly, we can make use of a bio basic biological concept of reaction norms and plasticity. Um, and essentially, so that studies and labs, um, even if they're highly standardized and controlled, uh, often vary in environmental contexts across a whole suite of different uh, unmeasured variables, uh, whether that be husbandry procedures or feeding, uh, feeding times or lighting or what have you, um, meaning that different studies uh, can fall on different parts of this reaction norm uh, and we end up with different uh, phenotypic outcomes. And then what standardization does on top of that is by reducing the within study variation it narrows this confidence interval around each study uh, such that outcomes become more distinct and idiosyncratic between studies. Uh, in other words, uh, results becoming less replicable across studies. Uh, and this has been dubbed the standardization fallacy by some. And so an alternative approach then is to, instead of minimizing variability to embrace within study variability, uh, this is known as heterogenization. And we've already talked a little bit in a way with Minaj um, on how we can account for some differences within studies by conducting multi-lab trials. Um, another way which my talk focuses on is to, uh, in purpose and in a systematic manner, introduce variability uh, within a single study. So how do we actually do that? How do we embrace and identify ways to embrace variability uh, as an outcome of interest in its own right uh, to improve replicability. And so in our paper, uh, we identify and argue that there are at least two ways uh, in which we can embrace variability in preclinical studies. And we illustrate these two approaches uh, through a meta-analysis of variability in wet animal models of stroke. And uh, this data set was obtained from the Camaradas database. So first we'll demonstrate how we can through meta-analysis uh, quantify and embrace variability uh, generated by different experimental procedures. Uh, and second, we'll demonstrate how we can through meta-analysis uh, quantify and embrace variability generated, generated by different uh, drug treatment interventions. So embracing variability in experimental procedures, uh, what we wanted to do was to assess uh, how much variability could be generated across a whole suite of different experimental procedures, uh, anything from, say, the genetic aspects of the study, such as in the sex of the animals used, 
uh, to, for example, different occlusion methods for uh, inducing different strokes. And so we did this by meta-analyzing the inter-individual variability uh, as measured by the coefficient of variation, uh, and in particular, the variability in infarct volume uh, and the amount of uh, brain damage. So through this, we can begin to identify uh, procedures that generate different amounts of vari uh, variability in our baseline disease states uh, from those that generate uh, high variability versus procedures that are more consistent in their outcomes. And so for example here, uh, amongst the different occlusion methods to induce stroke in our animal models, uh, those that use uh, spontaneous occlusion procedures generated the greatest amount of variability, for example, uh, in infarct volume here. So whereas under the uh, standardization framework, we would have maybe recommended the use of, say, a uh, filamental approach to uh, methods of stroke induction, uh, which generate uh, relatively more consistent baseline disease states, uh, we argue instead that we should be quantifying variability uh, to identify methods that generate the most variability in disease states uh, and argue that using, by using such methods uh, where possible, obviously it depends sometimes on the questions that you're asking in the experiment, um, uh, we can create a more diverse and representative uh, distribution of baseline disease states uh, against then which treatment efficacy can, can be assessed. So then moving on to quantifying um, variability in our drug treatment interventions. Um, so again, we can take a meta-analytic approach, this time quantifying both the mean effect uh, of treatments, so the efficacy of treatment outcomes, as well as the variability or stability of drug interventions. And by doing this, we can start to identify different groups of treatments based on where they fall onto, uh, onto this 2D quadrant. Uh, so everything to the left of this uh, vertical line are treatments that have on average a beneficial effect. But then over on the top left here, we have treatments that also increase the variability in outcomes uh, such that the results are inconsistent across individuals. Uh, whilst on the bottom left here, we have uh, drugs that are on average beneficial, uh, but also uh, beneficial across uh, individuals consistently. So in doing this exercise, uh, we can begin to identify drug treatments uh, with a wide range of efficacy and stability. And importantly here, we highlight in green the treatments that have on average uh, significant efficacy whilst not significantly increasing the variability. Uh, and so we argue for that uh, for these treatments due to the lower uh, variability observed among individuals, uh, the average effectiveness may be more generalizable to the population level. Uh, so we also here in blue and pink uh, identify some treatments that are significantly uh, effective on average, but also uh, significantly increase the among individual variability. And for these treatments, we argue that due to the higher among individual variability, uh, translation or application of these treatments to a clinical setting uh, may require slightly more nuance and maybe more individual specific. Um, and for those that particularly care uh, specifically about stroke interventions, I've highlighted here the thrombolytic uh, group and the hypothermia. Hypothermia, uh, interestingly, had the uh, most uh, greatest efficacy uh, in their meta-analysis, but also the greatest inter-individual variability as well. So uh, taken together, we argue uh, maybe that uh, the, the current failures in replicability um, may be at least in, due, uh, in part due to the way uh, studies are designed and assessed, which is to uh, minimize or ignore variability. Uh, so instead, we first recommend that we should be creating a more heterogeneous, uh, more broadly re representative backdrop of disease states in order to avoid context-dependent outcomes. And then secondly, we also advocate to embrace and assess uh, variability in our treatment interventions uh, in order to maybe identify potentially generalizable uh, interventions. And then just a quick uh, final slide to say that, um, uh, so we tried to quantify this uh, relationship between the uh, amount of variability induced by methodology uh, versus the consistency in outcomes uh, we observed in our treatment effects. 
Um, but so we were a little bit limited in their project by the data structure and the number of data points available. Uh, but we would love to, uh, in a future work, try to uh, do a more formal and rigorous uh, meta-analysis or second order meta-analysis, uh, linking these two, uh, two variables together. And I'm happy to chat about that with you guys more. Um, yeah, thank you for listening, and you can find your paper here. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Takuji. Sorry about promoting you to postdoc. It's always very <laughs> embarrassing when you judge people by the quality of their work and they turn out to be much junior, more junior. I also very much like the soul tire hanging on the wall behind you uh, and the lion rampant. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, got our first question in, if you were able to take questions. Um, someone is asking uh, whether, uh, how is it that the use of male and females together leads to lower variability than rather than higher variability, and how do you interpret that? Yeah, that's a really good question uh, that we also struggled to interpret. Uh, we tried to kind of assess this in multiple ways, but um we don't have a good good answer for that one um, um other than to say that there are um, obviously when conducting meta-analysis there are many uh confounding variables also with in doing meta-analysis and uh perhaps that there are some things that we haven't quite accounted for uh that could explain that difference um yeah i know that's not a satisfying answer but we <laughs> we were also not satisfied with that answer as well so yeah. A second question from uh, Jeff Mogul. Uh, don't uh, so his expectation. Don't more effective treatments have to have higher variability as a, almost like a statistical fact? The bigger they are, there's more room for a difference between zero and the effect, and therefore they tend to have more variability because presumably the the uh, less effective treatments with higher variability never get published because they never get out of the ground. Mm, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, so um, I would agree. Um, in our analysis, we do try to account for um, publication bias uh, about uh, more effective treatments uh, being published, um, and as well um, in terms of the effect size that we use, the LNCBR. Um, um, we uh, it should account for um, mean differences um, uh, and that effect uh, the effect that the mean differences actually have on the amount of variability. Um, if that kind of answers your question. Okay. And then uh, Shambhavi again raises the issue uh, of the difference between those things that vary between labs that are within the gift of the investigator to control and those things which they may be completely unaware of, latent differences like the lux in the animal house or the heating or the noise, how do you account for those factors which might be driving variability of which you've got no knowledge even that there's Donald Rumsfeld, it's the unknown unknowns. Yeah, um, again, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think the maybe the point is that we can't account for these kind of things and um, so um, yes, uh, um, the point is to try and, um, uh, so several things, uh, the first point being uh, by, uh, as Manoj mentioned earlier, uh, doing uh, multiple lab trials, for example, uh, we can try to account for some of these within different, uh, within variability, uh, within the different um, uh, labs itself uh, that we can't really account for. Um, yes, um, and the other thing is to try and actually systematically uh, uh, induce this in our experiments. Um, yeah. Two further comments which are related, uh, which I'm going to uh, uh, comment on before handing over to you. Uh, Dan Fanelli says, isn't it because mix six is lower standardization, thus reduced variability between labs? Romain Daniel Gosselin. Isn't heterogeneity in models a good thing because our patients are heterogeneous? And my sort of comment added is that in Equipped, we've taken three different paradigms, open field, Irwin safety testing, and some EEG reporting, and deliberately introduced heterogeneity within labs and found then that the results between labs are more similar than if you don't have that heterogeneity within labs. So is there a trick here about building heterogeneity deliberately into our experiments? <laughs> 
and see that if a, if a treatment survives that, it's more likely to be generalizable. Is that, does that make sense from an ecology and evolution point of view or not? Um, yeah, I think it does make sense, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't really have a good explanation for um, any yes. addition to that, yeah. Yeah, so, so to, to remain so back when I was a, when I was trying to think about drugs to take into clinical trial, I'd want to see that it works in a whole range of places mm -hmm. in, in the hope that it might work in a whole range of patients. The problem being that some human clinical trials have inclusion criteria which are so narrow that the results aren't generalizable from the trial population to the human population. So maybe we need mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, we, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time for you, our final speaker, and we're going to have 15 minutes of, of time for chat at the end is Tracy Weisgerber. Now, Tracy is by background a vascular physiologist and preeclampsia researcher who's become uh, a meta-researcher uh, with a particular interest in transparency and reporting and also meta-research around data visualization. And if you haven't seen uh, her materials to teach about, uh, and it's on the Open Science Framework as well as described in a couple of papers, uh, to, to teach and train people to have appropriate data visualization, well worth, well worth the visit. But she's going to talk to us today about how complex claims supported by multiple lines of evidence obtained using very different methodologies influence the direction of basic biomedical research. So Tracy. Okay, thank you for that very kind introduction, Malcolm, and also to Manoj for setting up and organizing this session, which I've really been enjoying listening to. Um, this session is going to be a different a little bit from some of the others, because while others have data and studies and results to show you, I have a problem um, and a solution that I'm proposing that I'm not sure if it will work yet because I haven't tried it. And therefore, I'm very interested in getting your input on it before I start trying it and find out that it doesn't work. Um, so the question I'd like to raise today is how can we evaluate complex claims? So many of you who are attending this session will already know that systematic reviews and meta-analyses are a very valuable tool for evaluating the quality of evidence as well as the quantity of evidence for both clinical and preclinical research claims. And certainly we've heard confirmation of that from a number of our speakers today and some innovative ideas about how those results can be used. However, one of the limitations of the current systematic review and meta-analysis methods that we have is that they're really designed for simple claims that are supported by a single line of evidence. So they require us to define our research question and the types of studies that we're interested in, in according to the population and problem, the intervention or exposure, the comparison, the outcomes, and the study design. And this often means that we need to have a single clear research question in mind. And that research question needs to be supported by a single line of evidence or a very consistent study type um, that we can assess to determine whether the claims are founded. Unfortunately, there's a lot of times when that's just not actually what happens and not what we're faced with. So what do we do if a claim is supported by multiple lines of evidence? So maybe there are some human studies, some animal work, possibly some in vitro work as well, and maybe multiple types of evidence within each of those different study types. Um, and again, that those lines of evidence come from very different methodologies, maybe done in very different systems. How do we go about evaluating these types of claims? So let's take a look at what a complex claim might look like. And the reality is that complex claims are very common in many different fields. Um, one of the examples of, a of types of complex claims that are particularly relevant to this section is complex claims surrounding the pathophysiology of disease and the mechanisms of disease. So why do we think a disease occurs? Um, these types of claims are often based on the accumulation of evidence that's built up over decades from both human and animal studies, as well as potentially in vitro work. Why does this matter? Well, I'll start off with an example from my previous field, preeclampsia, and one of the claims that you will very commonly find in the introduction of many papers is that preeclampsia is caused by shallow trophoblast invasion of the uterine spiral arteries. And this is a claim that's so widely accepted that it may not be 
cited, it may not have a citation at all. And if it does have a citation, it may simply be a review article. Um, it is simply something that's a baseline claim that everyone accepts as being widely true. I attended a workshop sponsored by the NIH a couple of years ago for preeclampsia researchers. And one of the things that came up was that there are multiple lines of evidence for this claim, but among people who had gone back particularly and looked at the human studies, the evidence for this claim is actually shockingly weak. Um, so there are a very small number of studies based on a small number of patients, their biopsy studies with uncertain tissue types and the diagnostic criteria are also be uncertain. Uh, they are also older studies, hence the diagnostic criteria may not match what we would use today. Um, and so the consensus in the room was very clearly that additional research is needed on this topic using modern imaging methodologies that we have available today and would be very insightful. However, everyone in the room also felt that no granting agency would fund that type of study because it's a claim that's so widely accepted as fact that if you come in and say, I wanna reevaluate this using modern methods, they would tell you it's a waste of funding. Um, and this isn't an idle problem because these types of complex claims influence the types of studies that we perform. So they influence the direction of research for human studies, investigating pathophysiological mechanism. They influence what animal models we developed and we select as being relevant to disease states. And they also influence what therapeutic agents we select for development and testing. So poor information or proliferation of these claims that may not be well supported has an impact on the direction of entire field and could potentially be sending us along the wrong pathway for years to come. So what happens when we look back at the evidence for complex claims? Well, we have a couple of different problems. And the first is that we may have difficulty identifying all of the lines of evidence that are relevant to us. Um, so again, if things are being cited through reviews and the literature supporting the claim is older, then it can be difficult to find out exactly what all of the pieces of evidence that led to this particular claim being accepted are. And we also have this issue of the evidence building over years and decades, which I've mentioned previously. And this is a problem because evidence that was convincing at the time it was published 10 or 20 or 30 years ago might be judged very differently by today's standards. And one of the strengths of systematic review and meta-analysis methodologies and the reasons that they're so powerful is because they allow us to evaluate all of the evidence systematically using a very clearly defined set of standards. So we review everything through the lens of what we know is important today. And this is a really critical tool that it would be nice to be able to apply to these complex claims. So how can we go about applying systematic review methodology to evaluate these complex claims? I'm going to propose that we might start with a process that involves five steps. The first step is we need to select a claim to evaluate, identify lines of evidence, and prioritize and select which lines of evidence we want to include and how important we think each line of evidence might be to supporting the claim. We might then conduct a systematic review of the evidence for each line of evidence supporting the complex claim. And finally, we would pool all of that information together according to our earlier prioritization in order to conduct a pooled assessment of the evidence. So if we break this down further, what might that look like? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is select a complex claim to evaluate. We need a topic to study, and I propose that that topic should meet two criteria. The first is that knowing whether the claim is supported would have major implications for the field. So if we find that the claim is not supported, it would have a major impact on the direction of research, on the animal models that we're using, the treatments that we are thinking about, the types of human pathophysiological studies that we are conducting. And this impact measure is important to make sure that it's worth the effort that this type of an intensive review process is going to take. And then the second criteria is that a traditional systematic review isn't possible possible, often because there will be multiple lines of supporting evidence, and that evidence may come from studies with very, very different methodologies or based in very different biological systems. 
Our second step is to identify the line of, uh, lines of evidence. And here, I think it's important to plan and pre-register a protocol that specifies how we're going to go about identifying the lines of evidence for these three strategies. And there are three things that I think we consider should consider. The first thing is examining the citations that are used to support the claim. And oftentimes this is going to involve a lot of backtracking through chains of citations to get us back to the original research that was done to support the claim. Particularly if the claim is well enough accepted that it's no longer being cited or that it's being cited to reviews which are then citing other reviews. The second thing we might go to is expert interviews. What do people in the field think underlies this claim? What studies can they point us to? What lines of evidence do they know of? And then there's also investigator knowledge, which is simply another form of expert advice. And we need a pre-registered protocol that specifies how each strategy might be implemented. Our third step is to select which criteria or lines of evidence are relevant, and then amongst those selected, prioritize which lines of evidence should or are most relevant um, to supporting the claim and may provide the strongest evidence for that claim, whereas which lines of evidence provide a weaker level of evidence for the claim or more indirect. And again, I think having a pre-registered protocol here is important, as well as um, once the ranking is done, very clearly registering what the ranking was, because that will become important in the evaluation of pooled evidence step at the end. Um, so, in terms of defining selection criteria, um, one approach that we could use to be to evaluate each line of evidence according to Hill's criteria for causation, and then also some thinking about how important each line of evidence is to the claim being evaluated. Is it direct evidence? Is it indirect evidence? Um, how, how tangential or directly relevant is it to the claim or the human condition that we're looking at? And then we would need to have a ranking of each line of evidence that was included based on the criteria described above. The fourth step is perhaps the most straightforward, perhaps not, um, and that is simply to complete a systematic review for each included line of evidence, which would involve preparing and pre-registering protocols and then completing the reviews and meta-analyses if that's appropriate. And then the last step is a pooled assessment of the evidence. And so the final assessment needs to be based on the strengths of each line of evidence, as well as the relative importance that were assigned to each line of evidence in stage three. And this assessment as well should be conducted in accordance with a predefined protocol to prevent our knowledge of the evidence um, and what we might like the answer to be from interfering with our weighting of the evidence once we have full details and a full assessment. When we're reaching conclusions from this process, we're going to want to address the following points. The first is the strength of evidence for the complex claim. And the second and perhaps more important is an evaluation of the strengths and limitations of the body of evidence. So what types of additional studies do we need, if any? And that should be assessed both with regards to existing lines of evidence and potentially new lines of evidence. So are there newer methodologies that would be beneficial to fill some of the gaps that were identified in the more historical evidence that we found? And then finally, what are the implications for the field of the previous two sets of findings? Um, this is simply a summary table of everything that I've gone through before, outlining the five steps and some of the key things for each stage. And that is the end of my talk. So I'm happy to answer questions if there are questions and if I have answers. Fantastic, fantastic and really interesting. Uh, there are no questions, oh, my chance just disappeared. And let me see if I can get a chat back up again. Uh, but uh, this is, so, so th there are other domains in which this is so, so, so there's two approaches for this. One is, if you like, is is uh, pool validation, where there's a claim or a belief system, and we're saying what's the evidence for it. And the other you might think of is push validation, which is to say, can we get a claim from this literature? Is there an is there, is there a knowledge claim we can make? There are some other fields like the navigation guide that Tracy Woodruff done and Neohat approach have got a similar challenge in that for a regulatory risk assessment for environmental chemicals, they're looking at mechanistic data and 
data from experimental exposures in animals and data from human epi. And the way that they combine it is by saying, if you, they, they take a grade type approach, they say, is this evidence, you know, high, medium, low, and then what, what happens when you put it all together? Um, and then the other approach, I suppose, and Manos might know about a bit about this, is could you do a network meta-analysis of the of, of the different claims to get at to get a quantitative to get a quantitative response? I don't know though, Manos. What do you think? I don't know if Tracy had any thoughts first. I... <laughs> um, yeah, I think. So part of the issue for me that I think is one of the larger ones is just identifying the claims and the evidence to begin with. I think the, the challenge of that process cannot be understated, especially for um, things that are more historically based. And I'm also, you know, I've also been thinking about would it be possible to develop software tools to kind of go into what's being cited and trace things backwards as well. Um, so I think there, there's really the two pieces there. It's the how do you identify and prioritize the evidence? And then what do you do with it once you have it? And I agree with you that there's a lot more work done probably on the, what do you do with it once you have it side? And there are more options that one could consider. Yeah, yeah, but it is, and there's, there's a lot of stuff in the chat. Uh, uh, so let me come to, so Dan Finelli mentions, uh, uh, that he proposed a metric uh, in 2019 might help to combine multiple sources. I think was this the K index, uh, Dan? Uh, and he's put a link in the chat where he describes it and he's working on a method to quantify all terms exactly and to combine them qualita qualitative, uh, to combine qualitative and quantitative knowledge. Uh, Jeffrey Mogul's uh, got a, a couple of open questions. Very interesting idea. It strikes me that it's going, all going to be a bit dependent on your weightings of the different evidence streams. You know, do you prioritize in vitro findings over in vivo findings or whatever? But don't you think your preeclampsia uh, example is a rare one? And the much more frequent uh, situation is that something's already known. Brain area X is involved in trait. He hasn't put known in inverted commas, but I will. Uh, and people waste money showing it again and again and again with increasingly sophisticated modern techniques. And then he makes a little comment on, on your phrase complex claims. And it's not, he, he argues that it's not the claim that's complex, it's the evidence which supports the claim. The claim is simple, but some claims have got simple evidence behind them and some have got complexities. But I don't know if you've got a comment on those. Yeah, so I agree with the um, syntactic definition. It's it's more about the complexity of the evidence supporting as opposed to the complexity of this of the claim itself. So that could certainly be clarified. Um, regarding the question of whether the problem is more that people are reproving the same thing over and over again with newer technologies, or it's more a problem of claims not being evaluated. Um, in my field, I certainly think that it's more an issue of claims not being evaluated. I cannot speak for all fields or for other fields, but I think, um, you know, the one the one problem the problem that you've raised you can see right like you can see if someone if studies are consistently coming out with newer methodologies proving the same claim, but if something is so widely accepted that it's it's not being evaluated anymore and the original evidence isn't being cited anymore, then it essentially becomes an invisible problem. Um, and so I could see those, those types of things in your field not raising to the same level of consciousness because you're not being reminded, they're not visible. They're essentially just, you know, in my field, there are multiple things like this and they're all just lines that you read in the introduction of most papers and most people just read over them read past them um and we've had a couple of examples of people you know starting to question some of those those claims and really leading to very transformative ways of thinking for the field and i think we need more like that um, and that means we need more critical evaluation of these things that we really aren't even looking at the evidence anymore because they're just so widely accepted and the evidence is so old that it's not even cited. Yeah, yeah and that touches on something I heard from a colleague uh, earlier this week about a group that were involved in seeking to replicate a claim using a different methodology and the way that they knew their experiment worked was if it confirmed their claim, 
And if it didn't confirm their claim, well, clearly there's something wrong with the methodology. And so they would they would exclude those data points or exclude those experiments or keep doing it again until they got the right answer. That's great, Tracy. We've got about 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to do to, uh, just now, uh, there's, uh, I'll have us ready, so open to general questions. And the first general question is for you, Tracy. Wouldn't a systematic ontology for describing claims in a standardized language uh, in particular fields be a necessary step or be a very facilitating step for the sort of thing that you're proposing? I think that's something that could be quite interesting and I would be interested in discussing and learning more about that. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, Shambhavi again, so when citing something in a field that's been historically accepted as true for decades, would it make me more sense to cite the original source of the evidence? Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, uh, I can take that. There's a lovely book that Cassidy Sugimoto, who's one of the core hosts of this, has written with a colleague who I'm afraid I've forgotten, that goes into all of these citation practices. And there is these this problem that the original citation gets lost in subsequent citations. And so the originator of the idea doesn't get the, uh, doesn't get the credit. Okay, okay. Lots of people happy, particularly with your talk, Tracy. I'm, it's all right, I'm not jealous. Uh, 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 but I thought all the talks were excellent. Do any of the uh, other panellists have any questions for each other or any comments on what they've heard from the other talks? Uh, Alex, you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, thank you, Tracy, for your talk. Um, really, really interesting concept. Um, and I guess uh, I can just speak to some of the very exploratory work that we're doing um, with the... Um, European Space Agency, which will be presented at the International um, Astronautical Conference next week. Um, Dr. Mona Nasser has been working really extensively um, to help prioritize different streams of evidence and to help answer um, questions that are relevant for um, astronaut health, um, where often actually the um, outcomes that we're interested in um, seeing. So we've got clinical data that has um, relevant health outcomes, but the, um, the way that the study has been conducted is um, not direct enough. So then we have to go back and look at some of the in vitro studies. Um, so yeah, it's about prioritizing kind of the strength um, of the evidence and prioritizing the outcomes. But yeah, we're um, very, very exploratory, um, but hopefully I'll be able to um, forward her talk to you. And someone asked the title of the book. I've actually got the book. That's how, that's how keen I am on the book. It's with, with, within an arm's length away. Uh, now, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Karis Wong, who, who uh, I, I talked about in my talk, thanks for interesting talk. How can we improve and evaluate the methods that we use for prioritizing lines of evidence for questions where we don't know what the ground truth is? And I suspect that that would include, for instance, areas where we don't know, you know, in areas where we're still trying to develop treatments, we don't know what an effective treatment looks like. So we can't we, we can't focus our approach to delivering that answer, because if we knew the answer, we wouldn't have to do the research. If you if you Yeah, and I, I think unfortunately, um, the unsatisfying answer to a lot of these questions is we just need to start trying stuff and see what what works. I think there's you know, this is the limitation of a presentation without data is that there's no, um, you know, once you have examples to work with, you start seeing where the problems are and where the strengths are and what additional considerations come up. And I've certainly, we've seen this a lot in the automated screening working group that I've um, been working with for a while. So I, I think it would be nice to have something similar here in the way that we want to test and start examining this approach would ideally be to do a couple of different claims in different fields to get a sense of what obstacles we run into, what challenges we haven't anticipated, um, whether there are steps or stages that we've missed. And um, it's something that I, I feel that this type of problem, you just have to learn by doing. And unfortunately, you can only think your way through the experiment so far. And for the for any youngsters uh, uh, listening in, there's nothing wrong with learning by doing. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with learning by doing when you've got a protocol. Uh, and you just have to say, when you get to the end of reporting what you did, we did it slightly differently from how we were going to do it. And this is why, and this is what we found. Um, 
Um, the best advice I ever had uh, about uh, about research when I was explaining to my boss at the time, Jeff Don in Australia, how I couldn't possibly try and do meta research and systematic review because it, my first one would be lousy. He said, well, your second one won't be any better until you've done your first one. Best bit of advice I ever had. Manors, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah, just following up on that, um, you know, Tracy's project there, you know, I think um, uh, I'd be interested in talking to you later, Tracy, because we've we're doing something uh, somewhat similar, but in an area very specific to my clinical um, uh, expertise, which is anesthesiology. So it's looking at uh, uh, heart attacks or myocardial infarctions that occur perioperatively. Uh, and there's this thought that they actually occur in different ways than uh, than a typical heart attack that a person has off, you know, when they're you know doing gardening or whatever, right? So it's... Um, uh, really similar sort of uh, parallel uh, issues that we're running into. We're actually using Hill's criteria as well, too, which is sort of interesting when I saw that on your slide. So I, I think uh, if you are interested in, you know, looking at other disease states or other complex claims there, I could send you the protocol for what we're trying to do. Uh, the issue right now is that, um, you know, we did our search to try to find and there is 25,000 citations, which my students are going through right now. And there's no Unfortunately, there's no real great way to go through them that's automated using available tools because a lot of the data is qualitative, right? So it's uh, you're searching for lines uh, within a larger paper often. So it's uh, very complicated and I'd be interested in hearing more thoughts about that offline as well. There's about a, 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 about a question for you, uh, Manoj, but uh, uh, with my sister who's an educationalist, We've done a systematic review of uh, master's education provision in Europe or something and used uh, the citation screening algorithm, but just and just fed the decisions into it. And it worked. It's magic. There's the James Thomas magic box. It's fantastic. But the question for you is from Mark Avey. Could the experience that you've got in building up the sepsis project uh, in Canada uh, be applied to other disease models, either in Canada or, or elsewhere. I think he's because he, Mark's based in Canada as well, isn't he? So I, want, I think he's wondering whether you could share. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, absolutely. And uh, we actually it's a great question. Um, uh, we actually just got two meeting grants uh, right before the pandemic uh, from the seat, like our federal funders to um, basically conduct a meeting to raise awareness and start discussing multicenter studies in Canada. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously Canadian focus, but even uh, especially in the current uh, setting where everything's virtual, there'd be no problems at all, even having other international people uh, who are interested uh, come to the meeting. So we're, we're hoping to do that in the spring. Um, so obviously, if you're Canadian, uh, you know, we might be able to bring you in person if in person's allowed. Then. <laughs> but, uh, you know, certainly even international folks that are interested, please contact me. Uh, I'll put my Twitter handle in the uh, chat box here, plus uh, my email. Uh, so feel free to contact me. We've already you know, talked to mainly cardiovascular and respiratory researchers in Canada and some international folks. But uh, you know, Jeffrey, if you're interested in pain, uh, you know, certainly contact me. And uh, Mark, I know if, uh, Mark is the new director of standards for our um, animal welfare regulatory agency in Canada. So um, you know, certainly probably some interest there as well too. So. Yeah, for sure. Yes, is the bottom answer. <laughs> Great. So, so we're coming to the end of our, our time. One of the things that we've not touched on, and you mentioning, Mark, that brings it out, is that, of course, when we do animal research in particular, there's an ethical cost of doing the research. And so anything that we can do that improves the quality of information that we're able to get from the research that is done improves the benefit while sustaining the harms at the same level, so improves the ethical position of animal research. Uh, and so I think that's I think that's critically important. Uh, so I'd just like to thank Manoj again for getting us all in the same virtual room, all of the speakers for what I've found to be a fascinating, uh, a fascinating uh, set of uh, talks. We're all going to be able to head over to. Remo uh, for at least uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. Some of us have to drop off after that. So if people want to carry on the conversation uh, there, uh, come across. If not, thank you all for attending. Uh, and I think we're about ready to start the next session. So thank you. <laughs>